Uh, settle in, this bio is going to take a while. Um, so Hugan is the Director of Social and Epidemiological Research Department at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, otherwise known as CAMH in Toronto, Canada. Uh, the Director of the Institute for Mental Health Policy Research, the head of the PAHO World Health Organisation Collaborating Centre. In addition, he has been appointed the inaugural chair for addiction policy at Dalalana School of Public Health of the University of Toronto. Uh, and section head for the epidemiolo epidemiology at the Institute for Clinical Psychology and Psychotherapy of the Technical University Dresden in Germany. Uh, Jürgen has published more than 700 peer-reviewed journal articles in addiction research. He is listed amongst the ISI Thomson Reuters globally most highly cited in the fields of social research and epidemiology, the top 1% with respect to impact as measured by citations. He's been awarded the Jelinek Award, the most prestigious award worldwide for alcohol research. He's served as a consultant to many countries and is a member of the WHO Expert Advisory Panel on Drug Dependence and Alcohol Problems. So please welcome Dr. Rem. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank the organizers for inviting me to come to this very interesting conference. What I will try to walk you through is global alcohol policy, but I'll do it mainly based on research on in Europe for a number of reasons. I will then discuss wider implications. So, if that works, yes it does. Conflicts of interest, in the last five years, I have received research grants from a pharmaceutical company. Uh, all of that was uh, prior to 2015. Unfortunately, overall, there's not a lot of research going on into medications for alcohol use disorders or alcohol dependence. And this company, at the end of two years, basically closed down their efforts in alcohol and let go 6,000 people. So, what is the current basis for alcohol policy uh, as reflected by international organizations? And basically, the biggest event for alcohol policy was the 63rd World Health Assembly, the uh, parliament of the uh, World Health Organization. And they adopted in 2010 a resolution which uh, is a global strategy to reduce the harmful use of alcohol. In that strategy, there is a number of target areas, and you see that uh, those target areas. The uh, harmful uh, use of alcohol at WHO is very broadly defined, and in the operationalization, most of the operationalization in all of the publications to, to, to date is basically using all kinds of alcohol, all kinds of consumption, because even uh, some kind of what we call light to moderate consumption may have uh, detrimental effects on cancer. I'll go back to that later. What uh, are the main areas? You can read them, but uh, WHO is stressing very much the so-called three best buys, and those would be restriction of availability, a ban of marketing and advertisement, and also a reduction of prices via increase of taxations. And so what are best buys? Best buys actually come from a number of studies which has looked into the cost effectiveness of different policy measures. And not surprisingly, those policy measures which can be made on a governmental level without individual are the most cost effective. It is simply easier to bribe a number of politicians to pass a law uh, than to actually do service to people of alcohol dependence in different uh, institutions. So overall, uh, that is one element of cost effectiveness, and you see the exact definition there. But also, it is uh, something which extends beyond this very 
rigid economic approach as something which is actually feasible and possible in most countries. So uh, there's no um, problems in theory of it, and it could be implemented into the respective health systems. This is the official definition. So what is the, how did this global strategy come about? And basically, what you don't have to read the whole thing, but what basically is that after a while of about 20 years of no alcohol being talked about at the WHO level and in the UN, there has been a revival of alcohol and alcohol policy, and a lot of that currently is driven by the NCD framework, and the NCD framework, non-communicable diseases, is something which is, has led to the only UN uh, high-level meeting on health. Usually UN meets on war, on uh, uh, things which uh, are considered global crisis, and health is not among them. There are some special meetings who have been dealing with drugs, like the one uh, this year. But uh, the high-level meetings, this was the first ever on NCDs, and they came up with an idea on what to do about reducing the mortality to uh, non-communicable diseases, and among them was to reduce alcohol, harmful use of alcohol, by 10%. So what was the theoretical basis of all of those policies? Well, uh, it goes back quite some time, but basically there had been a number of efforts to study uh, what is driving alcohol consumption in a country, at a country level, and uh, w there had been a number of books, a succession of books, which basically uh, states that those kind of measurements, like taxation increases, like ban of advertising, like reduction of availability, are necessary to impact on the average or the average volume of consumption in a society. The idea behind that is that all of those societies march in concert, i.e., if the mean goes up, all of the groups go up. There's clearly, as we've seen in, uh, in the prior um, presentation, different levels of substance use in different subgroups. But overall, the theory here states that once in a country, the overall uh, level of alcohol consumption is reduced, all of the subgroups will reduce, including the very heavy uh, users. What is the reality of those uh, politics and of those uh, theories? Well, the re reality is that Despite we have this strategy and those books now for 20, 30 years, there has been little success in actually moving on the best buys. We do a rhetorical WHO meetings where countries come in and all applaud to each other in having implemented even one more alcohol action plan and one more of this and one more of that. But if you actually look at the data, they're pretty sobering. The alcohol around the world has never been as cheap as it is, as measured by how much an average worker has to pay to get uh, 10 grams or that's an Australian drink or 14 grams uh, one drink of alcohol. That's true almost throughout the entire world. Alcohol has never been more available globally and in most countries availability has increased drastically over the last 30 years. And the bans of advertisement and marketing have been very scarce outside of the Muslim world. And that is something, there is no trend that those kinds of measures would actually increase. Moreover, in a lot of countries, 
uh, were uh, the high income countries, and that's only high income countries, the trend of uh, alcohol has actually been going down despite more availability, despite less price, and despite having the highest amount of advertisement ever. Thus, overall, to give you an example, in the WHO European region, which is a region which has more than 50 countries, including some which are geographically not Europe, those are countries in Central Asia, the alcohol consumption over the past 25 years has been going down. However, there are difference in different countries and regions. So what we are constating is Alcohol consumption and the harmful consumption of alcohol, as defined by WHO, has been going down in that region despite a complete um, negligence of the best buys and despite alcohol being the most available ever on all fronts. And uh, if you go into the different regions, you'll see on, the f uh, on this picture that there are differences over the past 25 years, and those data do include unrecorded consumption. So this is the first time that for a full region, for all 52 countries, we did estimate unrecorded consumption for every year between 1990 and 2015. Usually, what you see in the GBD studies and other studies is more or less uh, an estimate backwards from 2015 or 2012 when there were such unrecorded consumption estimates and there had been no effort to actually make them on a yearly basis. These are new efforts. But what you see in there is that in a lot of countries and parts it went down, the EU uh, it went down. You see that in the overall um, the Mediterranean countries were the ones who have been constantly declining their alcohol use, not only over the past 25 years, but actually uh, most of them for about 40 years now. But uh, in the eastern part of the EU, it's about stable, and in Russia and surrounding countries, alcohol con uh, consumption after 1990 actually went up. And, uh, this is going on until 2007, and then in Russia it had declined, and we'll come to that later. Uh, the lowest curve are countries which are partly majority Muslim countries, and uh, those countries, however, do allow, who are in the WHO European region, do allow alcohol consumption it is a problem to estimate unrecorded consumption in those countries because whatever we send as official letters to Turkey since the last four years, Erdogan has declared that there is no unrecorded consumption in Turkey, and so no Turkish scientist is daring to give us numbers with their names attached. We get them only anonymous. So. There's even more uh, variation at the country level. You see again the Russia curve, which is very close to the Russian surrounding countries. It is the largest country in that region with that drinking pattern. But you also see, for example, that Italy by now has an alcohol per capita consumption. All of my numbers are, by the way, uh, 15 plus. So it's adult consumption for better comparability, which is way, way less than Australia, for example. Italians by now drink around uh, 6.5 liters and that is very low, and that takes into account the unrecorded consumption, uh, which is mainly uh, wine production, which has not been declared. You also see uh, that some countries like uh, the UK actually went up and then down, and you see other countries like Poland going up. So overall, unfortunately, those kind of lines have not been explained by alcohol policy too much. We are currently doing a systematic analysis on all of the policy interventions in the EU, 
and uh, how they affected consumption or how they are associated with consumption. And the overall correlation is not any correlation you would cite in a scientific conference with Klee. So, overall, in the European region, there is even worse for our theory and for our policymakers. What happened in this region and where? And basically, what you see is, if you go to the very right-hand side of the slide, that alcohol attributable mortality, I'm not talking about dailies with all of those assumptions, etc. I'm talking about dailies, and I'm only talking about the dailies which are attributable to the four major impacts of alcohol, which is liver cirrhosis, cancers, Car uh, heart diseases or car uh, cardiovascular diseases to be exact, and injury, both intentional and unintentional. So only those uh, four big broad categories make up around 95% of all the deaths in, uh, for, for alcohol in that region. So they cover a lot. We did measure the individual disease categories, of course. And we did measure, we, go, we went into very long calculations. It took our uh, dear computer about four weeks to spit out all of those numbers. And then we uh, realized the programming error and were a little bit under stress for the timelines. But uh, this is the result after the programming error. And uh, we have uh, basically triple checked it now. And you basically see that we have in a region, like the European region, the phenomenon that alcohol is going down and alcohol-related harm is going up, which should not be the case. And we can say some of that even for within countries. So some something is wrong. Either the theory is wrong or the data and the death certificates and those kinds of things are wrong. What is the main driver of that increase? The main driver is a, is, is a region which is in Eastern Europe, which is Russia and surrounding countries. I'm speaking about Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldavia. All of those countries increased their consumption and increased their overall alcohol attributable deaths dramatically. They decreased their life expectancy. In those countries, alcohol is very, very closely linked to life expectancy. Once uh, the, um, an alcohol reform in the 1980s uh, reduced alcohol consumption in Russia, by about 25% under Gorbachev, who was then the Minister of Economics, not the Prime Minister. The uh, life expectancy for males in Russia, uh, Soviet Union at the time, I'm sorry, went up by eight years within a four-year time span. Once they did this uh, policy again, removed it, and a lot of other reasons, uh, market liberalization, etc. life expectancy dropped again quite a lot. Uh, in looking at those numbers, you have to uh, realize that Russia had about the same life expectancy as the U.S. in the mid-60s, about the same life expectancy as the U.S. And then the glorious government had the idea that it should do something for the people in making alcohol cheaper, in subventioning butter, in subventioning pork, and in lowering, halving the prices of cigarettes. Uh, that led to a decline of life expectancy, and in, in, uh, in, in the last 40 years now, it has been fluctuating, but on average, a male Russian who is 19 years old right now has a less than 45% chance to live to his 60th, 65th birthday. And this is mainly alcohol and even the small measures which they did between 2004 and 2008 
in Russia already led to an increase of life expectancy by about three years. So that's quite linked to alcohol policy, and that is where a lot of the increase is happening. All of the other con uh, regions, which you see on here, have slight decreases, and they're all, they're not that slight, they're actually, uh, part of them are 10%, 20%, like for the EU. Uh, except for the southern region, uh, which is mainly made up of uh, Muslimic countries where alcohol has increased and alcohol-related deaths increased. Now, I'm giving you year-to-year -year, uh, standardized rates of mortality, and I'm starting with liver cirrhosis. This is basically, except for the eastern region, reflecting consumption. Liver cirrhosis is one of those um, indicators which is very, very closely following uh, alcohol consumption. In most of those countries, alcohol has been responsible for 60, 70, in some 80% of all the liver cirrhosis. So this is a, a very closely followed indicator. The only exception are the uh, countries in the eastern part of the EU. There we have uh, way more liver cirrhosis than we would have expected based on their alcohol consumption, and there's no hepatitis which could explain that. And that has to do with a certain way alcohol is consumed, at least that's the speculation, that uh, in doing their spirits, uh, plum spirits and other spirits, not taking away the kernels in the process of producing the spirits is actually bad for the liver up and beyond alcohol. Usually 90% of all of the things when you have an alcoholic drink, the cancer, the liver problems, the heart problems, they all come from ethanol. Alcohol has 100 plus ingredients. Uh, there's at least four or five which are carcinogenic, but more than 90% is ethanol. So it's not about other ingredients which uh, are killing people usually, but in some regions there is an additional, uh, an additional toll of certain other ingredients. So this is, um, the standardized rates of mortality due to alcohol attributable cardiovascular disease. You see that most of the countries, and uh, there's uh, the black line which is for the whole region, which is basically uh, reflecting the population between Russia and its surrounding countries, which is around 180 millions towards the whole of the region. So it's, it's less than the rest. And so overall, the, 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 the average for the European region is uh, closer to the other regions. But basically, in most countries for cardiovascular, you have a sort of a wash. Basically, you have some beneficial effects of alcohol on coronary heart disease. You may overestimate them. There's a long debate on that. But biologically, there is good reason that there is a cardioprotective effect or a, a protective effect for ischemic diseases. And then we have the negative effects on hypertension, the negative effects on hemorrhagic stroke and on atrial fibrillation, on cardiomyopathy, et cetera, et cetera. And <clears throat> overall, since ischemic diseases, at least in the more western part, are quite large, they cancel out. In some countries, it's slightly negative even. In other countries, it's positive. But there's not a huge effect. Only in Russia and surrounding countries, we actually have an almost overwhelmingly negative effect. And the second culprit for those uh, differences are injuries. Overall, injury deaths and injury hospitalizations have been going down in almost all of the world. Problem is, alcohol attributable injury has still been going up or has been going down to a much slower slope. So basically, that uh, underlines the 
research which is necessary to have up-to-date information about alcohol attributable injury, it does not suffice, as it's done, for example, uh, by some, to use one alcohol attributable fraction and just apply it to all of the injuries, which has been found in the 1990s. We have to recalculate that every single year, and you have to make sure uh, that those numbers are correct. And if you look at them, you see that injury, both uh, unintentional and intentional, has been very much driving the overall mortality. So, what do we know about consumption and, 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 and uh, those uh, outputs? And this is mainly for mortality, but I could do a similar graph for others. Well, the volume of alcohol consumption is mainly driving cancers. Cancer is mainly tissue exposure. The more you drink, the higher your risk. It does not matter to your cancer risk uh, if you, let's say, uh, esophagus cancer, if you drink uh, alcohol two classes with your evening supper meal, as good middle class people should do, or uh, if you drink two bottles, uh, which is the same amount of alcohol if a class is 0.1. So basically, what you have there is, for your cancer, it doesn't matter. It's the overall alcohol you consume. And it starts at pretty low levels for female breast cancer. One class on average a day has been shown in several quite large cohorts to be associated with cancer. And that not even the alcohol industry is doubting that. Alcohol use disorders are also mainly driven by the overall consumption. Liver disease is a little bit less. Basically, it helps your liver if you do liver holidays. So if you drink very high, it is good for you to actually take out one day a week without any alcohol and let your liver uh, breathe a little. Infectious disease uh, would be more into the heavy drinking occasions because of the effect of alcohol on suppressing the immune system. The non-ischemic CVD would be there as well, and injury and ischemic heart disease are mainly driven by heavy drinking occasion. It doesn't matter to uh, your risk of a traffic injury if you consumed alcohol five days ago. Nobody can drink that much that he still or she still has alcohol in their blood after five days. So that's completely relevant. What is relevant is basically what, your, what is your blood alcohol level. What is indirectly relevant is what kind of a drinker you are. If you are a very scarce drinker, you don't drink a lot, alcohol has a bigger effect of you and your exponential risk curve for the blood alcohol concentration is kicking in at way higher levels than at alcoholics. We do have people who are alcohol dependent for 20 years who drove to their work uh, about uh, those 20 years without any uh, injury, without any uh, accident, but they had a blood alcohol level uh, which was greater than 1 and greater than 1.8, uh, greater than 1 in the morning, greater than 1.8 in the evening. So there is a kind of adaptation of the human uh, reaction times, etc. They still have less reaction time. That can be shown in, in experiments, but they still have also less injury. So, what are the implications for policy? I, we, we started about uh, policy. I gave you epidemiology, which we do to inform policy. And now, what are the implications? Well, we can continue as is. It's always an option. We can produce those kind of hallelujah reports every four years. How many action plans we have done this year, and uh, basically, it will not change the world. And even if we produce the 15th book now, saying that the free best buys are the best evidence ever, it will not change the world, because we know that most politicians would do 
uh, would not do a ban of advertisement and marketing. They would not actually really increase the taxes to the degree uh, to make them, let's say, uh, alcohol have the price of uh, 1965 or 1980 or something like that, because those would be so stark increases that even in a very nice, uh, tolerant society like Australia, they would vote down this government. So what can we do? Oh, see, the, the new one doesn't want to come. <laughs> Uh, we can actually produce some new effective strategies. Problem is, most of the evidence base is with the old strategies. We have uh, about 96 studies which have enough information to calculate the effect of taxation increase. Any meta-analysis will tell you it works. Doesn't work the last five, six years, it didn't work that often, but if you do a meta-analysis with all of them, including the ones from 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it works. And it's also basic economic theory. If something is becoming more uh, expensive, people buy it less. Very simple. We, that's how we react. That's how all of our decisions are based on. So um, it doesn't even, it, it doesn't happen the old ones, so what are the new ones? And we can do, for example, a minimal pricing. Minimal pricing is basically the, the evidence which is usually cited are two or three very small Canadian provinces and some pretty shaky statistics on them. Not very convincing, not what we would call grade A or grade level one evidence, but it has been uh, pretty popular because some parliamentarians in uh, the UK, in Scotland, and in other uh, island countries have been convinced by modeling, the kind of statistical modeling which we're doing, which is great for us because uh, it led to a lot of uh, new jobs for us. So great, but uh, the evidence base of modeling is not that good. So uh, there is actually a large study that minimum pricing was, being, was done in Russia and uh, nobody has analyzed it. They like their modeling so much, why, why should uh, empirical data actually come interfere with that? So another way would be the reduction of alcoholic strength. Basically, if you look into the history, alcoholic strength is what made, uh, what is the biggest problem. And we can easily reduce alcoholic strength. It has been done, for example, in uh, Northern Australia in putting a, a, a tax levy of five cents on everything more than 3% alcohol. That simple measure has, has led to reductions in injury mortality in Australia. So that's one of the field tests. You can also do it via a strategy that you convince the alcohol producers to do their share of the, uh, uh, to the common good by reducing the alcoholic strength because they actually make more money. If they reduce uh, the alcoholic content in beer from an average of 5.1 to an average of 4.5, that's more than 10% uh, reduction in alcoholic strength more people would survive. Clearly this would have public health effects. They would actually get the same money. The consumers wouldn't even notice. And um, they can put in water instead of uh, producing beer, which is cheaper. So it, it could be a win-win situation. I'll come up with ideas how to make them do that. But this is possible. And if you say, no, people drink to get the effects, to feel the effects, there are nice little experiments, uh, a fraternity, for example, a party where it was manipulated that they got beer which was 15% less alcohol. Same label, everything the same. Randomized, nice evidence. After the party, they asked them, how was the party? And they, Perfect, great party. Got drunk, everything was nice. So then they measured the blood alcohol level. So not subjective, blood alcohol level. And those who 
had the beer with lower alcoholic strength had much less blood alcohol. So we cannot notice alcohol. We have no organ in us to notice alcohol. And we are actually 10% plus or minus. We have no clue. And this would basically, and somebody who is drinking, let's say, three beers in the evening to relax, he will not drink four beers because the other things, the expectations, the ritual, etc., and of course because uh, you, it's a timing issue as well. So that would work. It would also work for spirits. We've done a lot of experience, experiments, including with alcoholics, about uh, spirits of 30%, 40%, 50%. No clue. They, they, these are 30% differences in alcoholic strength. They have no clue. They cannot actually uh, notice. Then we have uh, creative solutions about availability. And those uh, solutions would include things where we actually find a majority. The majority would be against increasing taxation by 30%. The majority is not necessarily against little measures. Like even in Bavaria now, they say that alcohol cannot be sold after 10 o'clock, uh, except in uh, pubs, but not, uh, not in... Uh, uh, fueling, uh, f fuel stations, gas stations, or other things. Okay, so there, we have to do something about the heavy drinkers. There is a huge toll of alcohol on heavy drinking. And as I said, in this European data, what happened is that those regions are already drinking pretty heavy, increased their consumptions. And so it doesn't matter if the average decreases. Same is true for societies. If the average in a society decreases, but your heavy drinkers are actually increasing their consumption, the um, toll, the harm, will increase. And that is something we are uh, experiencing more and more. Some of that is an artifact. If you decrease your consumption, people are more alert about uh, alcohol and, you know, uh, maybe more doctors are aware in the emergency room, oh, this could be alcohol because right now there's such a high theory about alcohol. But a lot of those effects are real. People, um, we, we have data on death which show that. So that's something, and the more, if you, if you drink on average 14 drinks and reduce by four, you do way more for your health, percentually, if you reduce from four to zero. The, the, the curve is relatively flat in the beginning, and then it goes up. So that's something, and that is also why interventions have to be there. It's also something why interventions should not take 18 years to happen, as we've heard in the first lecture today. That is part of the problem. You should intervene relatively quickly and uh, push the heavy drinkers down. A final one, which we believe uh, could help is something which came out of the Alice Rep project. And we would like to propose something like a health footprint. Uh, this is like a carbon footprint. You know carbon footprints and how they work? Basically, it's to shame industry in producing less toxically to have less problems for environment. And the same we could do with alcohol. We could, for example, come up with a health footprint which is concentrating on alcohol. We could make it uh, available. We could have an agency which is actually doing those calculations, as we have for, for carbon footprints, which is respected. And then uh, governments, industry, and others would have to report how many deaths did they produce with their policies. And that may shame some of them, as it did with carbon uh, footprint. They may also buy themselves out of it, but that would also, could also profit for uh, interventions, research, healthcare, in for treating alcohol. So basically, the uh, measuring a truck-related uh, health footprint is to drive and monitoring change. And we produce, uh, and we suggest the daily measure, because it's widely available. And we would proportion the alcohol-related delis across drivers and promote accountability. And this is what would happen, uh, for example, uh, with a 
beer brewer, and um, how many deaths and dallies are the result of their production. And they, if the, such a thing exists, they could use that and could say, okay, we reduced our alcohol content, and next year we produced 5% less dallies. It's, it, it is a negative concept. Yes, it is health-related, but the same as a carbon footprint. The carbon footprint is measuring damage of our environment. The health footprint is me uh, measuring damage of our health, and it is measuring the actions of others who impact on that health. So that could work. And uh, if we put them in, and if we make it part of our monitoring system, for example, WHO reporting those things, um, and this could actually be done without necessarily reducing profit. The carbon footprint has shown that it did work in helping to reduce. It is not by no way a panacea. It is by no way completely successful. But it's way better than doing nothing. And that is an effect we would also expect for alcohol. <coughs> so this is basically the book where those new measures are uh, collected and are being proposed. It will appear sometimes in 2017. Robin has been the only Australian because it's a mainly European um, uh, who had contributed to these ideas and to this book. He was part of the uh, International Scientific Council of that. Basically, there is a, num a number of other uh, ideas we could discuss. What I'm saying is it is very cheap and very lazy to just lay back and repeat the same old story, even though all of the people who are repeating it know very well in the back of their heads that it's no success and we will not achieve anything this way. So that's the alternative. We don't do anything or just repeat our maximal things and no action. And then the next report, which we're currently preparing to calculate, we come up with another great new story. Uh, alcohol now kills an adult every nine seconds in the world. Before it was 10, now it's nine. This is not because we have so much increase in alcohol. This is because the world population of adults is increasing. Just, but relatively speaking, alcohol is increasing. It is increasing, especially in India and China, and that is where most of the harm is, and that is where a lot of the statistics uh, which drive the overall uh, happening. So, what are the conclusions? We've looked at the current policies and their theoretical basis. We've given one prominent example of a larger region where they obviously do not work. Even though uh, we had an increase in everything, availability, uh, decrease in price, no uh, ban, the alcohol still went down. But even though the alcohol went down, the mortality as the hardest outcome of alcohol went up. So something is wrong. I could have done that with global data, but the global data on um, unrecorded consumption are a little bit more tricky, and it, they are not there yet to do those estimates for every country. Overall, there is a lot of progress in different societies in alcohol attributable mortality, but a lot of this progress has been made by reasons other than alcohol policy. Robin had a talk yesterday where he looked into Italy and uh, named regionalization and urbanization and the different roles of uh, gender roles, et cetera, as one of the main drivers why Italy went down. It is actually one of the few countries where the uh, effective price is still relatively high. So uh, th there may be some, there may be more than th those uh, reasons. But overall, it's not alcohol policy which drove it, it is some agricultural policy which contributed to a little bit of this, and most of it was done by other things. Then uh, we have to come up with ways to further reduce. I mean, alcohol attributable harm, 
I've spoken about relative terms, but even in absolute terms is way too high. We are risk, risk, risk a death of alcohol, which we would never risk for skiing, bungee jumping, or any other voluntary behavior. We would, if our country would put that much radon into our houses, they would demonstrate and uh, the government would be gone within seconds. No, we do treat alcohol differently and we have to reduce that. And so we have to come up with policies and those policies actually are available but most of them, which are currently the most evidence-based, are not an option for politicians, so we have to be more creative. Thanks a lot for your attention. Um, now, the poster session's due to start right now, but if people are happy, we've got time for one or two questions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 